Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Marta, and I'll be your host for today. I'm very happy to see many people today ready to spend this hour together with us, with uh, eTwinning and the European School Education Platform. So I would like to officially welcome you to this European Commission's webinar on basic skills, Lessons learned from PISA. I hope you are ready to join us for an illuminating webinar on shaping the future of education, where we explore how education systems are adapting to preparing students for a rapidly changing world, drawing insights from PISA results. And actually, I'm not alone today, and I'm very, very honored to introduce you our guest speaker, Miyako Ikeda. Uh, Miyako Ikeda is a senior analyst at the OECD in Paris, where she has worked since 2004. She leads and manages the analytical aspects of the Programme for International Student Assessment. And without further delay, I would like to invite her on stage. Thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. We'll give a couple of seconds just to switch the presentation. Okay, I will share we my have time, so we are not in a rush. And great, we can see it on screen. So all is perfect. Thank you, Miyako. You can start now. Yes. So hi, hello everyone. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share the latest PISA results with you. In last December in 2023, two volumes on the initial results of PISA 2022 were released. The first volume looked at how students performed in mathematics, reading and science before and after the pandemic and how those results differ by student socioeconomic status, gender and immigrant backgrounds. The second volume examined which are the resilient education systems that promoted student learning, equity and well-being despite the pandemic. PISA usually happens every three years. The first one was in 2000. This eighth assessment was originally planned for 2021, but it was postponed by one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. PISA measures the extent to which students have acquired key knowledge and skills which are essential for full participation in social and economic life. The focus of PISA 2022 was on mathematics, while reading and science were also measured. PISA's mathematics test is not just about being able to reproduce routine procedures, but it is more about the use of mathematical reasoning to think mathematically to solve complex real-life problems in a variety of modern contexts. Around 690,000 15-year-old students in 81 countries and economies took PISA 2022. Why does PISA focus on 15-year-old students? This is because in many countries, it is around the age students are finishing compulsory education. So we would like to measure extent to which students can use their knowledge and skills acquired in and out of school system. So among the EU, all but Luxembourg collected PISA 2022 data. Now let's look at the latest PISA results. 
On average, across OECD countries, performance in all three subjects declined since PISA began. Between 2018 and 2022, mathematics and reading scores declined by significant amount, while science score did not decline significantly. Mathematics performance dropped by 15 score points between 2018 and 2020 on average across OECD countries. This drop is substantial considering that previous changes in OECD average never exceeded four score points in mathematics. On average across the EU, mathematics went down by 17 points, reading went down by 13 points, science did not show significant change. Next, we will look at the result of individual education system. When the recent performance change between 2018 and 22 are examined, it is important to interpret them in the context of pre-2018 performance trends. But before showing the result, I have a quiz for you. So here is the quiz. Uh, actually, I already, okay, here's a quiz. In how many EU education systems pre-pandemic performance trends, meaning that pre-2018 trends in mathematics were already negative and recent trends between 2018 and 2020, 22 were also negative. So if you click, wait a second, I'm trying to look for the, sorry about the, um, Kira, is it possible to send a link to Paul for this question? It seems that I cannot, Yes, the link to the survey is posted in the chat. So all participants should be able to see it. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. So the question again, the, the, how many EU system already showing uh, downwards trends even before the pandemic? in three education system, in seven education system, in 14 education system, or 20 education systems. Everybody put your answer. So Kira, can so you tell people... me? Yeah, people are responding, so yes. maybe let's give them a couple of more seconds. And okay. meanwhile, Kira, maybe you can um, uh, screenshot it. So then we just post it in the chat for the participants to see some of the results. And then, of course, you can discuss with them the results. So Kira, whenever you're ready, just inform us that the results are posted in the chat, so we know it. Meanwhile, I see the, that more answers are coming. Mm -hmm. so just to give enough time to the participants. It seems the quiz is not open. There is a comment. I tried, and for me, it seems to be open. Ah, okay, it closes indeed. I could see it before, but then it's indeed not available anymore. Okay. So let's move on and Okay, here is the answer. So in seven EU countries already show the downwards trends even before the pandemic hit. So the, the recent performance change, which are shown with the diamonds on this graph, 
should be interpreted in the context of pre-2018 performance threats, trends, which are shown with bars. So in mathematics, among the EU countries, starting from the right side of the figure, Portugal, Bulgaria, Italy, Poland, Estonia, and Cyprus, pre-pandemic trends was positive, but the recent trends were negative. So the trends flipped after the pandemic. In Romania and Malta, while pre-pandemic uh, pre trends was positive, there was no change between 2018 and 2022. And in Slovenia, Latvia, Ireland, Greece, Germany, Denmark, Austria, and Sweden, pre-pandemic trends were stable, but the recent trends were negative. In Croatia and Lithuania, trends were stable over the last decades, before and after the pandemic. And the final group is towards the left of the figure are France, Hungary, the Slovak Republic, the Czech Republic, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Finland. These systems, the pre-pandemic trends were already negative and the recent trends were also negative. So these are the seven systems, the answer to the question quiz. Sorry if that now the quiz didn't work. Um, so some education system managed to maintain or increase performance despite the pandemic while other education systems were showing negative performance trends even before 2018. So these results tell us that COVID is an obvious factor that likely impacted student re results. However, it is not just due to COVID. Long-term issues in education systems are also related to the drops in performance. So PISA's proficiency level two is used as a benchmark for monitoring progress against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 4.1.1. On average across OECD and also on average across EU, around 70% of students attained at least level two in mathematics. These students can interpret and recognize how a simple situation can be represented mathematically without direct, in, direct instructions. But we see a big variation across education systems. For example, over 80% of students reached level two in nine systems, including Estonia and Ireland. On the other hand, Less than half of the students reached level two in 35 education systems, including Bulgaria and Cyprus. Here is one of the level two mathematics item. Students were asked to compute the percentage of root triangles when the fifth row is added. Since the fifth row is not shown here, students have to extend the pattern by one row. So we prepare the poll again and hope this one works. Can you try uh, scan the QR code and then respond that what is the correct answer? 40%, 50%, 60% or 66.7%? So opening the quiz seems that we are ready to start it. I see all the players, including myself, in the arena, let's say, of Mentimeter. I think the quiz just needs to be started, but I think it's not working again. So maybe, Kira, can you please take over and see what we can do for this? Okay, if this is not working, just now they can move ahead. So the answer is 40%. With the with five rows, the percentage of blue triangles is 40%. It goes off the 
uh, to 10 blue triangles divided by 25 total triangles give her the percentage of 40%. So this item is intended to be easy and to get students thinking about the pattern beyond what it is shown. So this requires generalization of the model. So this is the level at which 15-year-old students are expected to reach at minimum. So in reading, around three quarter of students, 74% uh, for OECD and 72% for the EU, reached level two. These students can identify the main idea in a text of moderate length and find information based on explicit criteria. Again, there are big variation across systems. On the right, over 80% of students reached level two in 10 systems, including Ireland, Estonia, and Denmark. On the other hand, on the left side, less than half of the students reached level two in 30 education systems, including Bulgaria and Cyprus. Students' performance level varies greatly across system. Why do we see such a big variation? There is a temptation to think this is all about money. But while money matters for those education system that invest little, which are shown on the left side of the graph, for the system investing above a certain threshold shown on the right side, there is a no relationship between spending per students and learning outcomes. So this is the graph showing the investment in education and then country average performance. So this result suggests that it is important to ensure the basic level of investment in education, but beyond that, how you spend the money and how you allocate the money seems to be also important. The next question we often receive is, is low performance all about the reflection of student disadvantage background? PISA results show that in all education system, socioeconomically advantaged students, here shown as a blue triangle, those uh, advantaged students perform higher scores than disadvantaged students who are shown with the purple square. However, PISA results also show that poverty is never be a destiny. When comparing blue triangles, performance level vary across education system, even though these its, its students are equally advantaged. Similarly, comparing purple squares, performance level vary across education systems, even though these students are equally disadvantaged. In some education systems, even disadvantaged students perform high. For example, disadvantaged students in Singapore performed around the same level as advantaged students in Norway. This result showed that students' performance is not mere reflection of their socioeconomic background, but what matters is how learning happened and how schools and teachers support student learning in each education system. One more thing you may notice from this figure is that the performance gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students is wide in some countries such as the Slovak Republic, while it is narrow in other countries such as Kazakhstan. This socioeconomic gap in performance is one of the main indicators of equity in the PISA's context. Let's look at this issue of equity more in detail in the next section. In addition to math reading science, PISA also emphasizes on equity and student well being. This is why, in Volume 2, Resilient Education System was defined not only based on the mathematics performance, but also based on two other important aspects, equity and well-being. 
Talking about equity, those 10 systems marked with yellow are the ones achieved greater equity. These include Denmark, Ireland, and Latvia. These systems manage to minimize the impact of student socioeconomic status on their performance while achieving overall high performance. In order to achieve equity, for those systems on the top left quadrant, it is important to reduce socioeconomic performance gap while keeping overall strong performance. For those on the bottom left quadrant, raise all students' performance without reducing, uh, re without reducing socioeconomic gap in performance. Sorry, with reducing, with reducing socioeconomic gap in uh, performance. And for those on the bottom right quadrant, raise all student performance without widening socioeconomic gap in performance. Despite general concern about disadvantaged students being more affected by the pandemic, in a large majority of system, performance gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students did not change between 2018 and 2022. However, among the EU, some of them showed an increase in socioeconomic gap in performance. In Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Austria, and Cyprus, the socioeconomic gap in performance widened between 2018 and 2022, mainly due to the steeper decline of performance for disadvantaged students. In Romania, disadvantaged students decreased their performance and advantaged students increased their performance, which resulted in the widening of the gap. The third aspect of resilience is well-being. Well-being is a multidimensional construct. While PISA collected a variety of indicators on well-being, in our analysis in volume two, we chose students' sense of belonging at school as the main well-being indicator in order to make the analysis manageable. The, national, the rationale behind is overall students' life satisfaction is most linked to their satisfaction with their relationship with their parents. And this is followed by their satisfaction with their school life. A student's sense of belonging at school is closely linked to school life. We chose this as the main indicator for well being in our analysis. Compared to 2018, students' sense of belonging at school remained stable or improved in two-thirds of education system participating in PISA. Only in one-third of systems, it declined from 2018 and 2022. In Spain, Denmark, the Netherlands, students' sense of belonging at school declined between 2018 and 2022, but they are still above the OECD average in 2022. Hungary, Croatia, Finland, and Sweden Student sense of belonging improved recently and it is above the OECD average. In Slovenia, Lithuania, France, student sense of belonging improved over the last four years and it is around the OECD average. And in Belgium, st student sense of belonging declined over the last four years and it is about the OECD average in 2022. Bulgaria, the Slovak Republic, Student sense of belonging improved over the last four years, but it is still below the OECD average in 2022. And in Poland, student sense of belonging improved recently, but still show one of the lowest sense of belonging among participating countries. All other EU countries did not show change in student sense of belonging between 2018 and 2022. Now we consider all these three aspects together, performance, equity, and well-being. Japan, Korea, Lithuania, and Chinese Taipei showed resilience in all three aspects. To identify common characteristics shared by resilient education systems, we examined what 
they were doing in the following five areas. Learning during school closure, school life and home support, student pathway through school, material and educational resources, and school governance. Among many other findings in our report, we highlighted 10 actions which are related to resilience. As time is limited today, I will focus on those highlighted in orange today. But please take a look at the latest, the last chapter of volume one or last chapter of volume two, where we summarized these 10 actions in detail. First, learning during school closures. In education systems where performance were high in 2022, Fewer students experienced longer school closure. Less, prevent, less prevalent school closure is also associated with greater student well-being. In systems where student sense of belonging improved over the four years, fewer students experienced longer school closures. Keeping schools open longer for more students seems to be important. But how learning is organized during school closure also matters. In education system where fewer students encountered problems during remote learning, overall performance was high in 2022, and also students' sense of belonging improved over the four years. And we also found that the problems linked to socio-emotional aspects, such as a problem in motivating themselves to do schoolwork, tend to be more associated with students' sense of belonging at school. In contrast, a problem with more logistical in nature, such as problem in accessing to school supplies, is more related to student performance. So in many school systems, including all EU countries, students' confidence about motivating themselves to do schoolwork is weaker than their confidence about using digital technology for learning remotely. This has an important policy implication as this means that teaching students how to use digital devices is not enough. Students also need to develop strategies on how to motivate themselves to effectively navigate their own learning. Self-motivation is not just important during the pandemic time. We need it more than anything throughout life for upskilling and reskilling. The second topic is about the digital distractions. The use of digital devices in school is a contentious issue in many countries. On average, 30% of students reported that they are distracted by the use of digital devices, such as smartphones, during most or almost all mathematics lessons. And 25% reported that they are distracted by other students using digital devices during lessons. This proportion varies across systems. Over 40% of students reported digital distraction in Bulgaria and Latvia, while less than 20% of students reported digital distraction in Malta and Ireland. As ex expected, students who got distracted performed 15 score point lower than those who did not get distracted, even after accounting for student socioeconomic status. Then digital device also have some consequences for students' well-being. On average, over a half of students reported that they feel nervous 
or anxious without their phone. This rate is around 60% or more in Malta, Greece, Poland, Latvia, the Slovak Republic, Romania, and Cyprus. Having said this, spending time on digital devices is not necessarily a sign of poor performance. High performing students use digital device for learning in school up to five hours per day. In contrast, high performing students use digital devices for leisure in school up to one hour per day, but those who use it longer tend to score lower. This implies that high performing students know when to stop using digital devices and they have self-control over the use of digital devices. So what schools and teachers can do to ensure that digital devices do not distract students' learning? Many schools have introduced guidelines addressing the problem of distraction. Among various policies examined in our analysis, Cell phone bans turn out to be the only one related to the reduction of digital distraction. However, at the same time, PISA data also show that cell phone bans may have some downsides. For example, students in school with cell phone bans may not have adequate opportunities to develop self-directed strategy for using cell phones. So therefore, we need to further consider policies which limit distraction while help students develop agency in using digital devices. The third topic is about teacher support. In most education system, students scored higher in mathematics when they perceived their teachers to be more supportive. And they also reported less anxiety towards mathematics. It is crucial to ensure that students receive necessary and relevant support from their teachers. Even though it's obvious that teacher support is very crucial for student learning, in many systems, teacher support declined over the last 10 years. Education system which showed a de decrease in teacher support between 2012 and 2022 also tend to, tend to show a decrease in performance during the same period. While further research is needed to better understand why teacher support declined, it could be related to some system level issue, such as teacher shortage. School principals in 2022 reported more of the teacher shortage than 2018 in many education systems. In contrast, Principal in 2022 reported less of the material shortage than 2018. Teacher shortage are shown with the bluish uh, circle in this graph, and then the educational material shortage is shown with the purple, purple uh, circles. And those with the darker color show the significant change, and then those with the lighter color shows that it's not a significant change over time. Among the EU, all countries but Hungary, Sweden, Romania, and Spain showed an increase in teacher shortage. So the principal were more concerned about teacher shortage than before. However, the PISA data at the same time show that the student-teacher ratio was stable in many systems over the same period. So these results combined, uh, we can say that the 
principals increased concern about teacher shortage may not be because of the lack of the mere number of the teachers, but maybe due to some other reasons, such as teacher absenteeism, which is not, which cannot be reflected in the student teacher ratio or change of the teacher quality or the changes in the role of teachers or changes in the expectation towards teachers what kind of role that no teacher expected to play and often that before the pandemic teachers are more expected to focus on the teaching the contents but we observed in many systems that after the pandemic teacher expected to be in addition to the teaching um, contents, they have to play the role of uh, counselors and um, social workers and so on. And final topic is about parents and families. So we all know that the parents' involvement in education is important, but parents' involvement in school decreased substantially in many systems between 2018 and 2022. Among the EU, a decline is observed in Italy, Portugal, Spain, Greece, Malta, Lithuania, Estonia, France, Slovenia, Denmark, Croatia, the Netherlands, Poland, the Czech Republic, Sweden, Hungary, and Finland. In contrast, Romania showed an increase in parents' involvement. System that had the less negative trends in parental involvement tend to show less negative trends in mathematics performance. Therefore, it is crucial to strengthen school family partnership and keep parents involved in students' learning. And also that I would like to point it out that the parent involvement in schools uh, related to students' sense of belonging at school. So parental involvement is important not only for the student performance, but also for student well-being. Systems where students enjoy more support from their families, students tend to have stronger sense of belonging at school. While there is no doubt as to the importance of parental and family engagement in education, there is an ongoing debate on the appropriate balance and nature of their involvement, especially beyond children's early years. PISA results show that for adolescents like 15 years old, even seemingly innocuous activities such as sharing a family meal or just talking together or asking children what they did in school that day are associated with better student performance and student well-being. So we can start from the very easy step, asking what happened in the school to your children. That could lead to the better performance and better well-being of students. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, two volumes that were released last December are just the beginning. And more volumes based on PISA 22 results will be released this year. For example, we plan to release two volumes in June this year. The first volume is on the creative thinking, which is the innovative domain of PISA 2022. And later uh, in June, we will also publish a volume on financial literacy. 
And later this year, we plan to publish a volume on student readiness for lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miyako, for this very detailed presentation, which I'm sure will lead our participants to reflect on this topic in a more analytical way. And the points you mentioned on well-being and the sense of belonging were also very interesting for us and for our community. I don't know if you know, but the annual theme um, which we are working on is indeed well-being. So we are working together with the e-twinning teachers on well-being these years. And actually, we had not yet had the opportunity to analyze it from this perspective. So it really gave us a different angle to uh, address this uh, together. So it was really, really interesting. And indeed, if you could stay with us for some more time, we received some questions for you that I would like to um, read out loud. So uh, let me start from a question coming directly for, from the participants. So uh, what tools or methods could we use uh, in order to improve our students' results at PISA test? If you have any, any suggestions or any examples, concrete examples that you could provide. So um, PISA is now measuring not the knowledge or skill per se, but the application. So that the teachers have to teach not only the contents, but you know, have to teach the how those knowledge can be applied in real life context. So that's the really important part that no, um, so knowledge is not floating in the vacuum, but knowledge is rooted in the reality. So that showing that uh, how this knowledge the student are learning is related to the real life context and how they can use that knowledge or skills they are learning in the school can be utilized to solve the problem that will help the students to um, get the better performance in PISA. And then I'm not talking just about, and it's really not the right attitudes to increase the PISA score. That's not the aim of the PISA. The PISA is just a um, assessment. So we want to see that you now what's the student understanding and what the, how student can apply the knowledge. So that focus should not be that how to increase the PISA score, but focus should be how student can acquire the knowledge and skills that are essential for the future life and our participation in society, and then how much they can really master the contents plus the application of the knowledge. So the focus of the teaching, so the, the teacher training and also the uh, curriculum and all this you know, education ecosystem should focus on the knowledge plus application knowledge, not narrowly targeting the raising the PISA score but is the um, thinking about the student future capability. OK, thank you very much for answering these questions. And yeah, we have a couple of more questions for you. Um, did the PISA results uh, show any good examples of self-motivation strategies? Yes, so we analyzed that now data and then realized that, um, as I show, the student uh, after that no pandemic experience, 15 year olds no, adapted the remote learning quite quickly. Um, they're good at no, technical adaptation, use the video tool to communicate or participate in the class, but we found out that the motivation is the really the issue. The many students still feel that they are not confident in motivating themselves to learn by themselves. And then there no, we haven't had a really that no good example how to do it because this is the area that many countries are now interested in. And in our volume, no, volume two introduce one of the example, not just as a case that for example, in Singapore, 
towards the end of 2022, they introduced a new scheme and a few dates per month, students are asked to study by themselves at home. So students have to set their education goal by themselves, and then they have to learn by themselves at home to achieve the goal that they uh, set by themselves. So this is the now what Singapore introduced at the end of 2022 in order to cultivate a student now self um, directed learning. And also Singapore uh, government is very aware of that there are certain students who cannot jump into this kind of you know, self uh, directed learning. Some students need a scaffolding and some students need uh, resources like a laptop or mm -hmm. so that uh, they support material wise that support those students who need help and also the support students who need some guidance at the beginning. But the idea is that the guidance the student receive to navigate their own learning should be reduced as time goes. So ultimate goal is the student can learn by themselves, set the goal and learn towards that goal. Mm -hmm. But there are some students who couldn't do it are not left alone. Behind, they, need, yeah. Yeah, they, they receive support, special support for them. Okay, great. Thank you very much for answering this one as well. And uh, actually taking a step back now in, in your presentation, um, there was a question related to trends. So are there trends in how countries improve educational outcomes without widening the performance gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students? Yes, uh, there are several you know, uh, examples like that. So it's possible to raise everybody's performance or even narrowing the gap. So the good thing about the PISA is that um, by seeing other education system, we know what's possible. We tend to think that, oh, it's impossible to you know, raise overall performance without widening wide gap. But there are certain systems who achieved it, that goal. So the, by looking at you know, those systems, what they have done, uh, the weakness of PISA is that we cannot really tell the cause and uh, causal relationship, what caused uh, the change. So we, what we can say is only the relationship. So relationship can go either way, A resulted in B or B resulted in A. So that's the weakness of PISA, but at least that you know, we can show that which country achieved the goal that people may think that's impossible. And then also we can look into that what those you know, systems have been doing over the years. OK, and um, since you mentioned before the and actually quite many times the sense of belonging, um, why did a lot of countries not show change in sense of belonging between uh, uh, 2018 and uh, uh, 2022? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, before starting the analysis, we were really you know, uh, interested in how the you know, data show in 2022 because the, most of the students were out of school for a while and then they come back so that we thought that it might have a negative impact on student sense of belonging. But actually, we didn't see that. So it's a good news. Maybe no, this, this, this is just a hypothesis, but uh, student being away from school, school closures, and then they may value more the being able to mm -hmm. in school. They don't take it for granted that uh, being able to attend the school physically. Having said that, there are certain countries like you know, UK, United Kingdom, the, their uh, student sense of belonging is declining. And then that decline, it's not happening um, 2018 and 2022, but mm -hmm. it's more like earlier time, like 2012, it started the downwards no, trend, and then it goes down no, quite no, steep between 2020, 2012 to 2018. And then between 2018 and 2012, the decline is not that much. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the further analysis needed for this to better understand what's going on, but, uh, yeah, general trend is no, there's no change in sense of belonging at school, but there are certain systems that no sense of belonging decline, maybe not just because of the pandemic, but because of something else. 
Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> and one last question before we, we close um, is about Gen AI. So will this affect the next PISA test? Will it be implemented? What do you think related to that? Yes, so there's several ways that the AI is impacting PISA. So one thing is that no, in the questionnaire that we, you know, we are going to ask about the use of AI to the student, how much they are comfortable using AI. So that is the one area. And the other thing is that uh, more like a project running the project. So for example, the PISA has uh, one third of items, uh, open-ended items. Two thirds are multiple choice, so that it's quite easy to uh, code. But one third are uh, human coded, and the AI may be able to help the coding of some of the open ended items. And open ended items, you know, coding and you know, marking cost a lot in terms of time and in terms of resources for the countries. So that having the AI helping the coding, that may change the way that you know, uh, the uh, countries spend their resources. So that's the one area. And the other way is no, also not OECD wide AI is really a uh, um, focus topic now. And then discussing the how we can apply AI for analysis as well. That some part of analysis can be uh, automated so that uh, we don't need to do everything by manual. And then other project called Talis Teachers no, Survey, they use the AI for analysis and publish a report uh, a year or two years ago. So there's many it ways- It have that, a positive impact like, and facilitate uh, yes, yeah, the and, processes in mm -hmm, yeah. related, yeah, okay. That's great to know. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Miyako, for accepting our invitation and for bringing your expertise and your knowledge and, of course, uh, for answering all the questions of our participants today. Uh, before we officially close uh, this session, uh, just a couple of practical information. The first one is about the evaluation form uh, that my colleague just posted in the chat. So please save the link and fill in the evaluation form after the webinar. And the second one is about our upcoming professional development offer. We have some courses and some webinar upcoming. Please make sure to visit our course catalog on the European School Education platform, not to miss the upcoming uh, webinars and courses. OK, so we are moving towards the end. Um, I would like to thank all the participants for joining today and for listening to us. Uh, once again, uh, Miyako for the um, presence here and for the great presentation and the great insights um you brought us today and actually i would like to leave uh, the floor for maybe a final word a suggestion that you have for our teachers or anything you would like to say uh, as a wrap up let's say yes so uh, by analyzing the pisa data we really realized that the teacher is really the key for student learning and then believing in the student potential, so growth mindset, so and then support students who need help in a way to support that you know, um, they can fulfill their potentials. So teacher has a, such a big power. So I hope that you, know, you continue a good work in the future. And then thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. And yes, we have really great teacher here. So I'm sure that we, they will listen to your advices. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, I wish you all a good evening. Uh, I invite you again to visit our course catalog, not to miss uh, the next appointment. And Yako, once again, thank you very much. Bye, you everyone. Much.